Okay, LP, this is your lesson, and it's about James Joyce, of all things. And that is James Joyce, a picture of him. And um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about something I said uh, when we did the Zoom meeting. I'll try to put my face in the camera a little bit. I said that I, had, I was prejudiced against him. And I didn't, I didn't say I didn't like him, but I said I was prejudiced against him and that I had never read Ulysses. Now, I didn't explain what I meant by that, and prejudice is a very strong word, and so I thought I ought to explain myself. And first I'm going to talk about classics in general. Now this guy wrote one of the most famous books ever written, and is definitely considered a classic, and you know that I uh, often say that I really only read classics, and I hardly ever read anything that's not classic. Why is that so? Well, because when I was in high school, uh, I was doing very badly in all my classes, and uh, my brother was also doing badly, but he would always ace all his tests, even though he never went to school and never studied. So I said, I'm Jimmy, why is it that you keep on passing on your tests in classes, and I just so they said, you got to read. He said, if you read, everything will fall into place. If you don't read, you're not going to know anything. And so, uh, but this was the problem. My brother's reading speed, when he opened a book to read, his reading speed was 1,200 words a minute. In other words, in one minute he would read 1,200 words, like when you were typing. You could type 30 words a minute. Well, imagine reading 1,200 words a minute. But actually, probably he could read faster than that, because that's how fast the machine went, that you could test a person. It didn't bother to go faster than 1,200 words, because nobody could read as fast as my brother. Now, I tested my reading speed, and I read almost 200 words a minute. And so, to follow my brother's advice, I went to the bookstore, and I looked at all these books, and I thought, just if I leave the books on one shelf, it'll take me the rest of my life, so it's not going to work. But the good thing to do would be, if I just read the classics, I mean, because that way I, I could get a head start because I'm only reading good, very important books. So from then on, and I was like 15, I only read classics. But this book, this guy would come up, and I would try and read specifically Ulysses. And I would always give up. And I gave up because the internet and Google did not exist. And on every page of this guy's book would be a dozen words that I would have to look up in a dictionary in order to get through the first page. But I can't spell. So consequently, I'd get out the dictionary. First of all, half the words wouldn't even show up in the dictionary. And the other half I couldn't spell. Well, I could spell because I could look at it in the book. Well, let's start with that experience. The first page of Ulysses in the first sentence, or the first paragraph, you get this. Introbio ad alte de. Well, what does that mean? Looks like Latin, but I have no idea what it means. So I look it up. In a dictionary, can't look it up because it's got a Latin dictionary, but now there's Google. And you not only can you look it up, but the text of Ulysses is so loved by people that so many people want to answer that question of what that, those words mean, that it instantly comes up, even before you finish typing it, it comes up, and it comes up the first thing listed, and it comes up under studies of James Joyce. Every single, if you put two or three words from his text in a Google search, it'll come up James Joyce. Because so many people want to know what these things mean. What did that mean for me before Google? It meant that I could not get through the first page and have any idea what it was about. And it angered me for many reasons because I couldn't understand it. It made me feel stupid. But now the situation is reversed because every time you come across not only some word that you don't know, but you come across the most interesting and strange information that you would never guess would be in a book. And so it becomes like a, a riddle and a puzzle. And so let's start with this. Intro, what does that mean? Mulligan's first words indicate a mocking parody of the Catholic Mass. Though it, in retrospect, the stage has already been set 
in his stately appearance carrying a bowl on which a, a mirror and a razor lie crossed, crossed like the cross. He is, it's a mock ritual. The shaving bowl represents the chalice that holds the wine that becomes changed into the blood of Christ. It's a Catholic ceremony. In other words, he's mocking the Catholic ceremony of, 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 of I, I don't know the term of it because I'm not Catholic, but this strikes me right away as uh, just like in Monty Python, the Holy Grail, when he says, fetch, fetch the holy hand grenade and count to three. Do not count to two. You must not count to four. They're mocking the church. So that's the first sentence. Then he says, he refers to his friend Stephen Dedalus, or whatever his name is, he says, you fearful Jesuit. Well, type in fearful Jesuit, and this is what you get. Ulysses contains many references to the Jesuits, also known as the Society of Jesus, a large order of Catholic priests and brothers founded in the 16th century by Ignatius Loyola, the Spanish knight, blah, blah, blah. So, now... He refers to a round gun rest, a round gun rest. And I said to you when we were talking about this, I said, what's that stair head? But I wasn't thinking about the stair head. I was thinking about the gun rest because that's the thing that long ago I looked up and could not figure out. And I looked up gun rest in a dictionary. It doesn't say anything and there's no word gun rest. But look at Google under round gun rest, immediately comes up, James Joyce used this term in the first page. The novel's first action, Buck Mulligan, came from the stairhead. The stairhead, that's this, they even, in, 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 in Google, they show you a picture of it. That's the stairhead he's talking about. Situates the reader on the roof of a small military tower. In Sandy Cove, seven miles from Dublin, on the seashore shores of Dublin Bay, Mulligan then stands at the stairhead and calls down the dark winding stairs of a steep stone passage <coughs> that connects the tower's topside battle station to the living quarters. This is an apartment house that used to be a military installation. It's around and down below where places you could live. Finally, he moves to the raised stone platform that once held, that's this, that once held a swivel cannon, but now, now serves as a makeshift altar. He came forward and mounted the round gun rest. So let's go on and get the point. Next page. The genuine Christine, he says, Buck says, this is the genuine Christine. You're going to look up genuine. Everybody knows what genuine means. Christine is a woman's name, but it's still with a small c. So you, you Google it. All you got to do is Google genuine Christine, and researchers of James Joyce will tell you all about it. For thus, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood of onus. Mulligan's words imitate the Catholic priest's action of presenting the consecrated host. Now, you might not have any idea what that is, but in the Catholic Church, when you are consecrated, they ask you to drink wine and eat a wafer, and the wine is Jesus' blood, and the wafer is his body, and it's a big deal in the Catholic Church, and, and he was raised not only as a devout Catholic, but all of his schooling was Catholic. And so he's, the whole first two, two or three pages is mocking and making fun of his upbringing in the church, and ridiculing it and joking about it. That's what all that first several pages is about. But I remember reading it many times and having no idea in the world what was going on. Even though those things I did myself exactly the same way. You should have understood it entirely. This is my body, this is my blood. The mocking substitution of Christine. He mocks, he substitutes Christine for Christ. In other words, a woman instead of a man. 
briefly makes Mulligan ceremony a satanic black mass, since this inverted mass is traditionally celebrated, in other words, a black mass, a reverse mass, a ridicule mass, is done over a woman's body. Then, a little further down it says, a little trouble with those white corpuscles. Just, I typed in, trouble with those white, and up came on Google, guessing for me, a little, put it in already, because so many people want to know what that means. The white corpuscles refer here to blood cells. In other words, Mulligan is having trouble transubstantiating. Transubstantiation is the changing of one thing to another. In other words, wine to blood is transubstantiation. A wafer to, bread, to, to the body of Christ is transubstantiation. Making one thing into another, like uh, we do on, on a computer. Mulligan is having trouble transubstantiating his bowl of lather into Christ's blood and is asking the congregation, and there's people who are listening, which is only uh, the other character, to bear with him. Gold points, next one, gold points, croissant, Christos, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M-O-S. The Greek word, which I just spelled, is that in, in the tenth paragraph of Telemachus compounds Christos, gold, with stoma, mouth, several orators of antiquity acquired this epithet, golden mouth, for how they spoke. Notably, St. John Christosmos, a renowned speaker and one of the three holy hierarchs of the Greek Orthodox faith. The one odd, the, the odd one-word sentence appears to com comment on Mulligan's even white teeth, which I don't have, glistening here and there with gold points. In the previous sentence, it is the first appearance in Ulysses of the book's revolutionary stylistic device of interior monologue, often mislabeled stream of consciousness. Interior monologue is to write what somebody's thinking, uh, even though it doesn't relate to the story. Finally, the ant, this is a line, and I moved to the third page because I wanted to conclude with this because it brings it back around to you and to the things that you write. The ant thinks you killed your mother. In brief, Mulligan says, the ant thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Then he himself reproaches Stefan. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, you, when your dying mother asked you. Here he remem re resembles his model, Ar Ar Oliver, who casually declared to all his acquaintances that Joyce was mad. Now, this is, gets confusing. I'll just summarize it. <coughs> when James Joyce's mother died, his family was at the deathbed. And they asked James to kneel down and pray for his mother, and he refused to do it. And therefore they said that James had killed his mother. <coughs> but James said that he could not because he feared mock, he, he, he feared mock piety. In other words, he feared to be religious falsely, which is odd because the whole, all the first